why are we talking about this in the first place? Uh, do you want me to start? You yeah, start you can that? start. All right. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things about text adventures personally is the ability to create a highly interactive like game. A lot of 2D and 3D games these days, you have to spend so much time creating art assets, special effects, coding in all the stuff to do with the interaction, whereas a text adventure, you can just write something and you have an interaction mm. easily. Um, so it's easy to add verbs and stuff to the text adventure so that the player can do all sorts of really interesting things. Um, and it can be end up being a lot more detailed. Uh, and so you don't have to put as much effort into the other components. You can just focus on making interesting interactions or even just one-off interactions as well between like an item and something else like uh, in Zork when you can feed pretty much anything to the troll and he can eat it. There's all sorts of weird interactions you can have with that and that's mm -hmm. just like one little thing in that game among many, many other things that is easy to make because it's just text. Um, and on top of that, text is powerful. Um, you can create something that is more terrifying than seeing it by writing it or something that ends up being more beautiful in somebody's mind because you wrote it out and they can imagine what that is or imagine what the terrifying thing is. So there's this really powerful interaction between mind and, and text um, that you can get with a text adventure or a novel that is not as easy to do when you're looking at it visually because you see the thing. You've seen the thing, that's it, that's what it looks like forevermore. You can't imagine what it looks like because you've already seen it. Um, and honestly, I think the text adventures are not are kind of underused. They used to be the only thing around because computers didn't have the capacity to do anything beyond text or just simple vector graphics or something back in the day. And once we got to the point where we could do 2D and 3D art, we just sort of dropped text adventures and they're pretty rare these days and usually obscured behind something else. Um, like I'm going to probably talk about it a little bit later, but I've recently started playing Hacknet and that's effectively a text adventure um, if you've played it. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit more later. Yeah. Well, as a writer, I'm totally down with what you're saying about the power of language um, and the ability to be able to do it on your own. For me, something that was really interesting, has anybody ever played the Parsley games? Okay, so they're like interactive live action text adventure games. So somebody plays as the text parser and you as the audience are the players. So it's kind of like a D&D &D campaign in a way that the text parser is setting this tone and this mood for the game that you're playing in a way that a... PC or a gaming console really can't do. Um, and my friends were on improv, so like their goal was always to be the most sass sassy text parser. Um, and so this idea of the text parser as this character that was able to like bring life to a game in a unique way, um, that you could play the exact same action castle multiple times with different text parsers and just have a very different experience um, really interested me. And that was something I was thinking about with writing this was like, what if the text parser was a character in and of themselves and they had voice and stuff like that? That actually just made me think, imagine if you made a text adventure where you could actually select the tech, how the, the type of text parser, whether yeah. it's sassy, <laughs> straight, uh, <laughs> sultry, whatever other thing. You can just yeah. <laughs> Snarky, yeah. switch out the text parser and you get a different experience. <laughs> well, what's really cool about when it's in person with a Parsley game is that you aren't dealing with a binary computer that can only be able to process certain things. Like you can have like a lot of fun with a human text parser in what they can say and what they can do um, and how you can take a command and kind of play with it, so. Or add little things into the, uh, in, t in between commands in order to hint at things you need to do because players don't know the things they need to do. <laughs> it is surprisingly hard to get people to do certain things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll be talking a little bit with that one with making the text adventure game of the challenges we had, but one was like, Getting the players to do the things we think are obvious to do. And that was kind of like a fun realization. I get very sassy at these yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Vince, could you talk a little bit about your game, Small World Online, because you chose to implement a text adventure in that. Um, and could you talk about, like, why you did that, how you did that, what it looks like? Sure. Um, so I would say that there are a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, the... I guess the biggest one is, uh, I made it during Ludum Dare. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay, for anybody who doesn't, it's a game jam where you have to make a game in 48 hours by yourself. Um, all the art assets, code and stuff, you have to write all yourself. You can start with a library or a game engine like Unity, so you don't have to literally start from scratch, but you still have to make all the logic art and stuff yourself over 48 hours, which is not a lot of time to make a game, <laughs> considering most games take years. Um, so I chose to do a text adventure 
because it's easier to add art assets, like I was talking, you can just write out a thing and hey, you have a thing. Um, in order to add new like armor or weapons, I just added a name and a couple stats to an array and boom, there it was, new thing. I didn't have to do any art. So it made it very easy to add features to that. Um, and second, I mentioned earlier the you can add interesting interactions um, with things. Um, so that was a big motivator for that, so that I could actually put in stuff that I thought was interesting instead of making another platformer that is just a platformer and maybe not all that special. Um, I'm pretty slow when it comes to coding, unfortunately, so I can get them done, but in order to get something that's really interesting, it might take me a while if I have to spend time on other things. Um, and third, I think it's really interesting to play around with text. I was kind of inspired because I think at the time uh, I was working on converting the first chapter into the into a demo of her book. And so I was like, you know what, this is actually really interesting and I kind of want to play around with this and play around with the medium. Because with the power of the computers we have these days, you don't have to stick to just text. You can have, you can, you can add graphics to it. Um, the way I did it is I had a small um, console with the text in it, and then below that I had some icons for your stats. You had attack, defense, experience, and whatnot, and so I could have little things for that. Um, and part of that was also adding in real world elements of like Outlook uh, reminders or SMS messages and whatnot, because it was dealing with the idea of kind of being addicted to an MMO. So you're playing this game, and then a reminder comes up being like, hey, have dinner with your parents, and if you don't, you know, log out of the game to go have dinner with your parents, then you get a message later on being like, hey, why weren't you there? So I was able to add in these extra elements that were you know, graphics and looked like real things that you would encounter on a desktop um, while it was still a text adventure. And I think it's something really interesting to be able to play with that kind of contrast between text and actual modern graphics. And I mentioned Hacknet earlier, and I think that one is particularly good at doing that because in essence it is a text adventure. You're, it's a basically a hacking simulator kind of thing where you're breaking into servers and um, doing things for a hacker group. And so everything you do in that is you type out a, a verb like you would in a, in a text adventure. Blah, and then you modify that command with various other things like go west, go east. But in this one it's, you know, hack SSH um, and then give it a, a port number or something like that. But it's all text, but in outside of that little terminal window you have, you have all these other elements showing you like the file system or a game um, that's part of the server that you're breaking into or um, a news organization and stuff like that. So there's all these graphical elements you have that are on top of what's essentially a text adventure. And I thought that is a really good example of where you can go with text adventures. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, da, da, da. so do I, did I cover everything in my notes here? I think that's everything I, think I had good. to say. Yeah, yeah so like on, on that note, I guess what's interesting about text adventures, they have such flexibility in their form that we can do some really cool stuff with it. Um, so like in this process of making a game for my book and a book kind of mimicking a game form, I guess I wanted to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses we discovered of these different mm -hmm. mediums. So what was it that was um, we were able to do really well with um, a text adventure versus the prose? Like what were some of the things we learned about that? Mm -hmm. Um... What were some of the things we learned? I'm trying to remember now. Well, so like converting prose into a game, we had a few stumbling blocks a bit with that. Yeah, so really, when you're starting with prose that is linear in its nature, you, and you turn in, try and turn it into a text adventure, you're turning it from going one thing into here's all these different branching paths. And that's actually kind of tricky because there's all these scenarios you haven't, you hadn't thought of um, when you're originally writing the novel that you then have to take into account. Like um, in the book, you start out at a graduation ceremony. Well, what if somebody tries to talk to the person to the left of them or in front of them? You, she didn't write that interaction out because that's not how the book goes. Mm. But in a text adventure, somebody might try and be kooky or clever and talk with somebody that you hadn't expected. So trying to come up with all these different things or even modifying it so that there's actually kind of a quest path you can follow or even multiple quest paths you can follow um, and being able to indicate those or have the characters in place that you need to. There's, I think, an entire room in the text adventure that didn't exist in the book yeah. with a character that didn't exist in that location in the book that had to be created by her um, in order to facilitate kind of the quest path and how it branches out and then kind of comes back um, toward the end. Actually, it doesn't really come back. It has a whole bunch of different endings. Um, so you have to 
you have to go through and figure out, okay, they can do this kooky thing here, or they, we have to add this room here, and um, figuring out the complexities of that, such as when you go into one of the rooms, there's like eight exits, and there isn't too much you can, well, there's probably something we could have done about that, but it, Where are you? What are you the hallway. Oh, we have, like, yeah, but there's door, like a million rooms. Another door, rooms. bathroom, yeah. all these different yeah. exits. And so in the book, it's fine because you just read past that and it's just a one off, kind of, almost like a joke. But in a when you're actually interacting with this as a player, you suddenly have all these options and you're like, okay, what do I do now? I, can I hear those exits again? You know, what, where, what do I have available to me? Yeah, and what was interesting, I guess, is like, when we were play testing it, because we play tested a lot, is people feeling like there was an aimlessness because they're like, well, what are we supposed to do? What are the triggers for what we're supposed to do? And as a novelist, you know, like I'm a writer is in control of their audience and is like, like bringing them down a certain path. So I kind of took for granted that in the novel medium that I was like, I want you to go here, then I want you to go here, then here, and I don't have to say that. I just write it and I'm bringing you there. So with the game, we had to like find ways to direct them through that experience. Yeah, figuring out ways to direct players is surprisingly tricky. Um, it can be as simple as adding a single sentence somewhere um, or as tricky as sassing at them every time they do something and they don't do the thing you're, you want them to do. Yeah. Because there, yeah. there isn't any realistic way to, to tell them to do something without ham-fisting it or having fun with it. So I chose have fun with it rather than yeah. ham-fist. <laughs> yeah, well, we had to be very explicit about things that we didn't think about. Because like with a novel, you don't have to be explicit about certain things. And in fact, like you really shouldn't be because the reader can pick up certain things. But with a game, like there's so many options that we had to do a lot to explicitly direct our player. Or even um, tone down some stuff. Like uh, in the book, you're in, you have an inventory and it has like 13 things in it. And most of them don't do much or they're just jokes. Yeah. Um, so you have to kind of tone that down and bring it back to what's absolutely essential and then maybe leave it in as an option if somebody wants to have fun with it. But like, yeah, really had to pare down to the absolute essentials so that the player doesn't get overwhelmed because especially if it's not on a screen in front of you, you have to remember all these things. Yeah. And there's only so many things you can remember at a time, so you really need to make it concise, especially for a text adventure that is an interactive one where you don't have that screen like you do. Like if you have a, like Zork, you can say, what's my inventory? And you have all your items list out and it's easy to go back and reference that. But if you're, you just have to remember it, then it's so much harder. Yeah, there was definitely like thinking about the mechanics of how a verbal game works versus a visual game. Yeah, um, so that's making me think of like why I was drawn to doing a text adventure novel. So like a novel, the author is in control and is guiding the reader versus a game where the player has complete control. And with the novel, I felt like I could mimic the idea of giving somebody control, kind of like I think of the game Life is Strange, where like you're given options and it makes you feel like you have control, but really you don't. So the idea of like fake control was really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, essentially all games are fake control because it's all pre-programmed, but... Yeah, but the amount of fakeness... <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Parable's a great example of yeah. that. Well, actually, what's particularly interesting about um, a game where you interact with an actual human is you can actually make it somewhat not, not pre-programmed because a human can actually be clever and come up with things. Mm -hmm. um, so you actually can come up with things on the fly if somebody does something weird that you hadn't thought of, which is particularly interesting, I think, to this particular medium. When it's mm -hmm. a, an actual text adventure running on a computer, you can still program in a lot of things, but it's still you know that basic set of things you can do. But if you're interacting with a person, that can be a lot more dynamic and interesting, I think. Well, and it's been a fun learning experience because each time we've played it, people have thought of new creative things to add to that. So then we kind of like add our responses to that. <laughs> and some of those people come to those the events and then they bring those responses. So like the game is continually morphing and changing because of the player interactions, which is interesting. You can't really do that without like a human parser. We have a lot of Easter eggs that are from people doing weird things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and they always think of things that like we never thought of, which is really cool. Well, I think that's the particularly cool thing about this one is when people do something we don't expect, we just add it in. It's a fun little extra thing. Yeah. I think that is something that could be, that would be an interesting thing to do with a text adventure as well, like an actual one where if you could log everything that people try and do that you're not expecting and add those in as patches over time. Oh. 
That would be cool. Like a living and morphing game. Yeah. See, like through talking about this, we get ideas for yeah. the future things. Yeah. If any of you are developers, feel free to steal these ideas and cool things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing that was kind of cool with making it into a game is that because it was a novel and it was like one linear path, this allowed us to kind of relive the story and play with it with all these different possibilities of what people could do. Um, we were able to think of a lot of different alternative endings and different solutions, which is a different way of telling a story than just saying, well, you've got to do this and then this. Yeah. How many endings do we have now anyway? Four, it five, keeps six. growing. Yeah. yeah seriously. <laughs> yeah. You can die all the time. It's like the old games where you just do the wrong thing and you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes exactly. it charming. <laughs> Did you have other thoughts about things that were challenges or rewards or realizations we had about the strengths and mediums of, of strengths and weaknesses of these mediums? Um, I'm trying to remember if there's any other things that I wrote down before. Um, I'm honestly not sure what more to say about it because I think I've said a, a lot. I think there's probably more I could say, but I'm just blanking right now. I'm just trying to think if there were anything else that we wanted to say about what did we learn about text adventures through this experience? They're hard to make. <laughs> yeah, I think we thought it was going to be a little easier than it was. It, we, it, there was so much attention to detail, I think, too. Like we were having to really think about every little nook and cranny and every possibility. Yeah, I think I kind of went into it a little cocky, being like, I'll just put all this stuff in here, it'll be great, I'll think of almost everything, and then everybody just destroyed all those assumptions. They're like, well, what do I do now? And I'm like, but it's obvious you do this thing in my head. And then they try and do a thing that I think, think of, and I'm like, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, and like with making anything, I think we had to set it aside, because we still had our biases when writing it. Like, well, obviously you do this, and obviously you do this, and then people play tested, and we edited, and they play tested, and they were like, we still have no idea what the frig to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, we had to kind of, like, put it in a drawer a little bit and get some distance to kind of think as a person who had never experienced the book, who had never experienced the game, of giving direction of how to go through that. Pro tip, any creative pursuit you do at all, getting distance from what you're doing or having other people look at it, super important. Yeah. You get so close to what you're writing and think it's so obvious, and somebody will look at that and be like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and each round of playtesting was so critical in that. I'm so glad we did multiple, multiple, multiple rounds of that. Oh, yeah. Got lots of good feedback. Playtesting, super important. Yeah. Definitely a thing I, I knew, but maybe learned a, actually learned how important that it was through this. Do you think there's any limitations of text adventures that we struggled with? I guess besides the fact we didn't have those visuals, I think that's one thing that we we had to kind of add our own visuals. We started using a whiteboard to show like, here's our inventory, because explaining the inventory each time is terrible, and to display points and stuff, but. I think the main limitation we ran into was something we already talked about, which was kind of a limitation of human memory. Yeah. Um, in a, like we we're, were saying, in a normal text adventure, you can see what you have way easier, but in this one, you can't, so. Actually, what she was just saying is a little solution she came up with where we outline all the important things on a whiteboard while playing. So when you're looking, you have like little icons in your inventory indicating what you actually have or what points you've obtained while playing the game or, and whatnot. And that helps emulate what a text adventure naturally does by displaying everything, like, ch like checking your inventory, um, in order to make it a little easier to understand where you are, what you're doing, um, where you need to go, and... Yeah, just like what's going on, like the current status of the game. So I guess the biggest inherent limitation for this is just memory. So if you're designing one that's for people to interact with outside of a screen, um, definitely keep in mind how many things somebody, anybody can remember at one time and try and limit the number of things that they have to think of at any one time. So only like three items in the inventory, four items maybe, only a few directions to go. So it's designed such a way that you don't, you don't have, if you have puzzles that are somewhat complicated, they have to be complicated with a relatively narrow scope in order to allow people to not get confused. So I guess I have the question of if we convert this to an actual normal text adventure at some point, do you think, like obviously that problem won't be there, do you think there's other limitations we're going to have to think about? Um, the biggest limitation would be figuring out how to parse human language, yeah. which is the hardest yeah, thing to overcome legit. these days. It's I think we'd have to solidify the core mechanics of the game because right mm -hmm. now they're kind of loose. You can kind of say something in a in a way that's relatively close to something we've already thought of, and, and we're we'll like just, close enough, and we'll just yeah. go with that one because we can kind of interpret like 
on like a computer, but a computer would have to, we have to say, okay, these are the commands you have, these are the interactions you have, yeah. and make those really solid of exactly what you can do in order to actually allow them to interact with that game, or at least try and have as many different ways of doing commands so that they can interact with that in a little bit more natural of a way, but it's still going to be inherently limita limited by the inability of a computer to understand human language because it's so complicated. I think something this process has helped me appreciate a lot more is subtle game design because directing your uh, player to be able to understand what the commands are, what they can do, and what they should be trying to do without being like, big red arrow, this is what you need to do. Because like you were saying, we'd have to explicitly explain the language, but when games are able to um, help us understand that without being explicit. I'm just like, I think I'm realizing more of like how incredibly hard that is and how amazing mm -hmm. it is when people can do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's the difference between Mega Man X and Call of Duty. Right. Call of Duty yeah. says, go here, here's a giant arrow, go do this thing, that's what you do, and Mega Man X is like, yeah. Right. Mega Man X is like, here's a world. Press buttons, I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> when it frames and designs the world in such a way that you naturally right. do those things and you naturally yeah. feel like what you're supposed to as a player instead of like that um, Ego Raptor video, you know, of like, hey, Mega Man, Mega Man. You know? <laughs> but I see why people do that more. I think as a writer, I was like, oh, this is so dumb that they're explicitly explaining that. But like through doing this, I realized, oh, crap, you really do have to make it really clear to your player or they're really confused. So like... Being able to do that in a non-explicit way is very, very impressive. As a quick note of that, it's easy to potentially think that people are being lazy when doing stuff like yeah. that. But I would think that there is a couple things in, uh, to, to consider that. One is time crunches. People don't have infinite time to figure this stuff out. Yeah. So sometimes the only realistic option you have is giant arrow. <laughs> Two, players are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> people don't read. Um, you can design as many helps things as you want and all these different things and people will ignore every single one and ask you how to do something that you had like 20 arrows <laughs> big red letters saying go do this thing over here and they'll be like I don't know what to do <laughs> so it's not necessarily lazy but sometimes it's just it's realistically what you have to do yeah, yeah absolutely um, so I guess with on that note like beyond this project like um, has making this demo and making this text adventure inspired any future projects? Um, well, I mean, we talked a little bit about Small World Online. Well, I talked a decent bit about Small World Online, and that's something I definitely want to develop more. Um, I made it during Ludum Dare, but I really want to make it into an actual game that it is a text adventure you're interacting with and it has all those extra elements in it, kind of like I was talking about with Hacknet. Um, I really want to... Playing around with a modern idea of a text adventure is something that's is absolutely fascinating to me now after doing this and reading your book, um, being able to try and figure out how you can incorporate all the different capabilities we have now, mm. e even with the ability to parse language, computers are better at it than they used to be. We, we do have libraries, ex we do have tools that exist that can to some degree parse human language and so being able to play with that and try and get it a little bit closer to being able to understand what the player intends um, on top of playing around with graphical elements and UI elements and whatnot um, are things that I really want to play with. Um, and actually, an interesting thing to note, if you, any of you are interested in making text adventures or choose your own adventures or anything like that and don't want to learn something complicated like Unity or Game Maker or any of those, there is also Twine, which oh, allows yeah. you to literally just write text and it will link together into other... <laughs> into other rooms and you can get you either really you can either be really simple with it or go incredibly complicated with it if you know like how to do javascript you can just go to the base level of the browser and just play around and add add all sorts of crazy stuff to it when you use twine for this too right um i did for work with bit. twine a little bit to try and create something um yeah. but it ended up being time constrained to we didn't really have enough time to put that together into something and we ended up wanting to do it as like actually talking with people instead rather than as a demo on the web, which eventually I'm hoping I can actually do something like that um, as well, but it's really fun to interact with people. Yeah. I love being a sassy text parser and being like, hey guys, do, do this thing over here. You really please do that. <laughs> um, well, and I think Small World Online 
also like that idea of interacting with the objects and creating objects to be able to do a lot of information for you. Um, that's definitely been something I've been thinking about with my future writing projects too. Of how can I have as few words as possible to be able to explain to my reader or my consumer about what's going on? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I guess one other thing I wanted to bring up um, that I had in my notes here is if you do make a, if you remove the graphical elements from a game down to like text or anything like that, you can focus, and I think I said this a little bit before, focus purely on the mechanics of the game. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of something like Door Fortress here. Door Fortress is just uh, characters. It's little little dude things that look like uh, faces that are just char characters in the Unicode spec. And that is the most complicated game ever made. It simulates reality. And someday they're hoping to simulate magic and ports and all these other insane things. But it's just little characters of text. It's at symbols and at 4G or an I, but it's simulating this insanely complicated world. So, um, like, I, I honestly feel like 2D and 3D graphics are somewhat holding back mm -hmm. game progress to some degree because we're so focused on making something that's pretty or cool or flashy that we're not focusing on, like, what cool mechanical things can I do? How much can I delve down into like these really interesting and complicated scenarios instead of making, you know, another flashy particle effect in Unity. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think text adventures are a great way to be able to do that too because you're really like digging down to the actual like structure of the game as opposed to thinking about, like you said, the visuals. Yeah, you're literally thinking about everything of like command on thing at level and it's, it makes it a lot easier to kind of build a game rather than building graphics. Can get to the actual gameplay first instead of making fancy graphics and realizing your game is boring as dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you have any final things that you wanted to add, or do you want to open up for questions? I have no. I don't think I, I've. I've said a lot of stuff. Yeah, you have said a lot. Of stuff. <laughs> I'm talking so fast, and I should have been talking slower so I could like extend it out a little bit. But <laughs> that's okay. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Anything that we didn't cover that you kind of wanted to talk about? So, if not building with Twine, what other things did you build text adventures with? Uh, or what methods did you use? Um, so, when I build Small World Online, I used GameMaker. Um, which I don't know if I would necessarily recommend Game Maker. I think it actually was somewhat limiting um, because it doesn't delve down and it doesn't give you as much control over keyboard input or uh, Unicode normalization or anything like that that you necessarily might want. So I would probably recommend, and what I'm working on is uh, using Unity because C Sharp does have all of those tools. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has probably a better input system overall. Like one of the limitations I ran into with Game Maker is you don't have, you don't get the magnitude of scrolling when you're scrolling a console. So you just have like 20 pixels at a time or something. So it, either, so it feels really unnatural. Um, it doesn't feel good to scroll the console and go read what it said and go read what you, the history has been for the commands you put in. Um, so I'd recommend something like that. Uh, you could probably do a standard text adventure in Twine. There's probably a plugin, or you can make it yourself if you're good at JavaScript um, in order to have something like that, because that should give you good tools around that. Beyond that, I honestly don't know of any tools that are focused around that. And I think that's because, like I said, everybody's kind of focusing on 3D graphics. So like Unity, mm. um, their whole thing is makes, you can just import models and do really easy things with that and particle systems are easy and whatnot. But they do have tools such as a scroll window. So you can have, you can just by default have that and then put text objects in there and be able to have it work pretty well. Um, so probably do something with that um, or Twine. Well, Unity would be more of a technical thing. And like for our purposes of doing the in-person one, you use Workflowy, which worked really well for just organizing. Yeah. People. So, yeah. So, um, in order to organize it, in or organize the text adventure demo for post high school reality quest, I just use basically a tool that's infinite nesting lists. Yeah. Which um, have links to other things. So when I when somebody says I want to go to this room, I just scroll down, click the link that goes to the list, and then it brings me right there. When well, I could see that being a really great way of like mapping it out too, because it was very visual, so it was very helpful for when we were actually creating all the paths. So I, I could see that as like a way that you could like create your draft before 
like actually programming or anything. And mind maps. Yeah. Um, exactly. Or sticky notes, honestly. Um, when I was at the game global game jam at Magfest, one team used Twine to make a game, and I saw them on the board with all these sticky <laughs> notes laying out all the different things they could do. Like there's, you know, you don't have to use fancy tools to make some to make a a an adventure in Twine. You can just use sticky notes and write down the the things. Um, so you can go pretty simple with that until you actually need to implement something, in which point Twine is the easiest, Unity is much, much more technical to actually implement that. But somebody might have something you can use to do that. Yeah? Are you eventually going to make the whole bump into a text-based adventure? I don't know about that. I think our next <laughs> step would be that we want the online format so that you can at least play like the demo um, online. I don't know about the full book, but we might continue to do like little bits and pieces of it. Yeah, the I would say the challenge with turning the entire book into a text adventure is so big. yeah, yeah. It's I mean, a, it was it was a lot for just like a chapter. If even a, I don't even know. If, yeah, it's the first chapter. It's the whole first chapter. I mean, just all the possibilities we had to think about and all the extensions that we had to write of everything people could possibly do. I mean, it's like five times the size of like yeah, the think, narration of the. I think if chapter. we're gonna do something like that, um, we would legitimately have to start pruning things. We right. have to be like, you have to go this way right. kind of thing. There might be some branching to change up some of the story elements, but I think allowing them too much freedom is just going to turn into this giant thing that is impossible to keep track of. But we would want balance because we wouldn't want it to feel we're going to do our walking simulator argument later today, but we wouldn't want it to feel like Dear Ruster. It's like, <laughs> go here! Now go here! We would want some balance of, like, feeling like you kind of have some freedom to make options and choices. So, that, that would be a hard balance, so I think that would be a big question of, like, how much do we leave? How much do we not? Honestly, it would probably turn into something kind of like Mass Effect, where there's all these different options out in the cosmos that you can do, but at the end it kind of boils down to a few choices, yeah. which... Is, I, I mean, like Life is Strange, too. Yeah, and it's, I know that that's a big criticism in gaming of, like, it, everything boils down to a non-choice, um, and that nothing you did matters, but realistically, when making these games, uh, how are you supposed to account for all the possibilities? Um, there's only so much you can do, especially with limited dev time. We could probably do something with more options than something like Mass Effect, because it would be a passion project done over a long period of time, yeah. without somebody paying us for three years to be like, get the game out, get it out. Um, and telling us how to do the game, too. Yeah, exactly. But it boils down to just a limitation of the ability to figure out all the different paths you can take. Because mm -hmm. if we were to continue down the same kind of thing we were doing with just the first chapter, it would become completely and utterly unmanageable and have thousands of endings and it would take decades to make. Yeah. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration like it really would. It would. <laughs> it would probably be, you know, twice as much writing as like the Harry Potter books in order to account for all the possibilities. Yeah. No, no kidding, yeah. <laughs> so take that into mind when you see if just only a few endings at games because they have limitations they have to yeah. work with I'm not necessarily defending the ending of Mass Effect I'm just saying they have limitations <laughs> <laughs> that we empathize with them as human beings yeah. <laughs> any other questions, thoughts yeah. yeah so in this particular adaptation about, about how much text did you use as source material and how much mm. you That's a good question. How many pages is the first chapter? Like, how long do you think it would take to read that? Like, 15, 10, 15 minutes, maybe? Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five. I, I will say Six that, pages. Yeah. And I feel like we did so much of making new, more in-depth versions of what's happening here. Yeah. Like, it glosses over so much that in the game you can delve into further, so... And I would say yeah. that the average playtime... Um, of one, like getting to an ending is probably around what, 20 to 30 minutes? 30 minutes, yeah. About 30 minutes. So we went from a six page first chapter to a 30 minute text adventure. And that's for one playthrough. So people often want to play it two or three times to like actually figure out, get used to the structure and all the options and stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure I can fully answer your question, um, but I think. I was thinking, oh, I just kind of translate what's here and I add a couple little options in an inventory and like it's gonna be K and there was so much more that we had to flush out. Like this just gave like the bones and then we had to actually add muscles and flesh and 
Yeah. So like the first version of it was, you know, there's a Google Doc. It had the first chapter. And then I went in and started adding bullet points of like, okay, here's, you, what if you do this? 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 Yeah. What if you do this? What about this? What about this? What? <laughs> well, and like, what if you do things in a certain order? Like, can you no longer access a certain space because it doesn't make sense to talk to that person again? And like, what if you talk to this person after this person? Like, yeah, you take for granted chronological order in a novel too of like this than this. And so you think, well, what if she talks to Sephra before you talk to so-and-so? And like, how is that going to affect the gameplay and how does it affect the release of information if you're like, I already know that or you need information before that? So Yeah, I know when I was, I put all those notes in and started talking with you about it, you were very surprised at all the like, well, yeah. wait, there's all these options. I have to consider these things. What? I, I have to actually put effort into this? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I would say there's probably at least two or three times as much writing. At in, least, at yeah, least a lot. in the demo version of it versus the actual like first chapter or two of the book. Yeah, there's a lot of extra stuff that had to be written for it. Yeah, and more gets added over time, as we said. Yeah. Great. Any other thoughts, questions? Well, we're going to end a little early. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Feel free to come talk to us afterwards. I've got copies of my book here and in the uh, dealer's room. And yeah, thank you so much. Go make text adventures. They're cool. Yeah. The moral <laughs> of the story is yay, text adventures. <laughs>